this is a new building. We're we're uh, we're growing, and one of the things with growing and becoming a true assembly, it takes finances to run this. So from now on, today we're gonna pass an offering basket, and from now on we're gonna put it somewhere stationary and just say, "There it is. Give us your fruits." We are in the process of. We're praying for a missionary or a couple, a team of missionaries to support, endorse um, a missions project. We, uh, we've got some big plans ahead of us, and I'm really excited because this group of people, man, it's so awesome. <laughs> um, yeah. We're going to... passing out the uh, address, the member book, trying to keep a record of who's coming and get a phone number. So if you don't mind, please fill that out so we can get your phone number. We stay in touch. We'll get a group message and everything going. Uh, give me a second. We're going to fill that out. We'll get into worship. Is that good right there, Todd? Right there. A little bit closer. There you go. This is this is weird. <laughs> um, You'd think a famous singer like you would be used to that. Well, try to stay humble. Try to stay humble. <laughs> Guys, let's open in prayer. Let's just let's just get with the Lord, and then we're gonna go into a list of praise and worship. Okay? Father. Spirit, we ask you to pour out from us today. To cut off the rough edges. Lord, I ask you to posture our hearts in seeking your kingdom, seeking your face. To be with you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. So we're going to go in. We're going to go in for some praise, worship music. Just get along with the Lord. However you want to worship, however you want to pray, just get along with it.
everything we do and say is a blessing to you, yes, Father. Yes, I do. I pray that every family here, every family represented, Guys, y'all mind passing it up? I'm sorry. body was broken so that we could be reconciled back to God. Be beyond any measure of a man. Unrecognizable as a man. that represents the blood of Christ is the redemption of our sins, the forgiveness of our sins, washed clean, never to be remembered. Thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness of our sins, for the for the redemption.
redemption, for you paid the price for our lives. perfect sacrifice. Thank you. Lord, we thank you for the washing of our sins. The forgiveness. You have made us without blemish. This is my blood. Take and drink. I bet his initials are Casey Mark. Initials are Casey. Quick. So today we're going to continue on some, some foundational teaching. foundational parts of Christianity that is not taught a lot is really how to pray. And for some of you, one of the things that we found um, that through my life is that in church, we have a tendency to not, I didn't make it two minutes, I told you it was going to happen. One of the most foundational things is, is about prayer. And, and see, what I have discovered through my life is, is that the church has has kind of fell down on something. And that is, when someone is born again, what it's almost as if we assume that they suddenly just know this. It's like they someone gets born again and they come to church. And nobody ever talks to them about, well, what is salvation? What does it really mean for you to be born again? What, what does it really mean whenever the Bible says to love someone? What does it really mean whenever the, the Bible talks about prayer? We just assume they got it. So like, like some reason that there's just an instant download the moment that you're born again and you just got all of this stuff. When the reality is, is that the Lord said make disciples. And so his intention was is that whenever someone, you lead somebody to the Lord, you disciple them. And in that, you teach them these things. Okay? So he's assuming, first off, the one that's doing the discipling knows this and understands this. And then they're passing this on to the one that they're discipling. They're taking what they learn their experiences, and they're bringing them up to where they're at. Because we know that there are a lot of things that we learned from our Christian walk that took us many, many, many years to do, to, to walk in the truth of it. Well, now when you're discipling someone, you can bring them up quickly to that point. They don't have to go through 20, 30 years of Christian life to suddenly learn, to learn that. One of the things is that because discipleship is really is not even heard of much much anymore in the church assembly. Uh, that's sad. And even the even in places where they actually tried to do this, most of them. Like now, obviously, when I say that, every, I'm not saying every single church out there misses it, but the vast majority of the visible church out there does. Even if they do try to. Talk about this 
discipleship. Their idea of discipleship is classes Sunday afternoon for the next six weeks. That's not discipleship. Discipleship is an invest is individual, individual to individual. And as a matter of fact, I've even heard a false teaching before, a false statement rather, of a pastor making a comment saying discipleship is not individual. It has to be done through corporate. No, that is absolutely opposite of what the scripture teaches. The scripture teaches that it is individual. See, we've lost sight and understanding of, of what it means to be the church. When we come to get, see, we have done the, the almost the very thing that the Roman Catholic Church did, which is it became all about the institutional church rather than the individual Christian who is the church. It became about what does the church say and being a part of that, even to the point now that you have to be, a, you know, there with Roman Catholicism. If you're not part of the institutional church of Roman Catholicism, they don't believe that you're born again and you're going to heaven. That's why they think I can excommunicate you and you're going to hell. Oh, well, you don't have that power. The reality is, church, what you see in the United States has lost it, its identity and it, because it's and it, as a substitute for that, you see a, a huge teaching that resembles Roman Catholicism in that aspect that the church institutional church assembly is the focus. So that's why somebody can make the comment like, well, it's not, and in, in discipleship is not individual. It's cor It's the whole church has to do it. No. That's because, and see, the reality is, it's you're taught what you do in Scripture as an individual, as a believer. You have all of God in you. He's given you the commands to go out and make disciples. Alright? So what we do is, is that we lead somebody to Christ, right? And then we disciple them. We pour our life into them and teach them also then to reproduce Christ in others to do the exact same thing. So in, in, in our midst of this, we have ignored that whenever a person comes to Christ, they don't know this because we quit. The, the church in the United States has really come short of discipling like it's supposed to. So therefore, what we have is 20, 30, 40, 50 year old people in Christ who are still babies in Christ. And they haven't grown any. They, they, they ain't grown any more than, than they were the day after they were and we think, and we come to this conclusion, we think that people, just time and service means maturity. It doesn't. You can be a 50-year-old uh, person that's been a Christian for 50 years and still be a baby Huey. I don't know, some of y'all not, not old enough to know what a baby Huey is. Get with me after the service and I will explain it to you because I do not want to embarrass myself. So one of the th what we've done is is that for those who are just first time listening to us and, and being here, is we're addressing first the foundational things. Because see, what this assembly is about is about the individual believer and about your identity in Christ, about you taking your place as a son and daughter in Christ. It's about you knowing who you are in Christ. You have to know these things in order to be able to function. So today, we're talking about prayer. Now, as we go move along, we'll see how fast this goes because there's no telling exactly how the Holy Spirit will take me as, as I'm going through this. But this, but this teaching goes from 
basically discussing here's what prayer is and then morphs into an understanding of what praying in the Holy Spirit is. All right? So one of the first things in my walk that I that the Lord had to grow me up in was to teach me to pray. For those of you that don't know the story, that there came a time in my life, I had been a Christian. I had been born again for 10, 15 years. And my life did not look much different than the world. I was not more than a conqueror. As a matter of fact, I wasn't even. spiritual walk and there came a point in time in my life when I said I actually I just had to get honest first with myself and with the Lord and say okay what I'm doing ain't working what I think or what I thought or how things are supposed to be it's not working because I see in the scriptures what it says that I'm supposed to look like but if I compare it to what my life actually looks like, they don't even resemble one another. Now, that's, that's starting to get honest, right? And I finally had to come to a conclusion, and I, and I said, I don't know. Because I'm going to tell you, even a baby Christian who's been a Christian for years gets this level of pride in their, in their life and think because you get you get some knowledge of the scripture, you can rattle off scripture and you get this attitude, well I have been a Christian for 15 years you can take that 15 and you can insert whatever number it is because if you're a baby, you're a baby and I finally, I sat down with the Lord and I said, Lord, I just don't know and I'm, I am laying aside everything that I thought I knew. Clean slate. I don't know anything. But I wanted to. That was the key. I wanted to know. And I said, I want you to show me. Because through my life, I had had so many conflicting teachings. So many people teaching you this and then you go to another person and they tell you the opposite of that and then you have all these different denominations out there this denomination denies this and this denomination does this and and, and all that and, and you kind of go well, what's the truth especially when the ones that you're asking you trust you know they're, they're people that you consider spiritual leaders of your life right and then you got spiritual leaders that are conflicting with one another in what they're teaching. And that becomes so confusing that eventually you get to a point that you kind of go, what, what's the point in even doing it? What's the point in even trying? If I'm going to live, if, if my life is going to look no different than it does than if I was not born again, what's the point? And so I told the Lord, I said, I, you're going to have to teach me. I'm just going to lay everything that I've ever learned, everything that anybody else has taught me, and I'm going to lay every bit of it to the side. And I'm going to say, show me in the scriptures, teach me. So the very first thing the Lord did was he taught me, because see, I had to learn to be able to hear him. If he's going to teach you, think about this. If he's going to teach you, you have to be able to hear and recognize his voice. Because I'm going to tell you, the enemy will come along and try to imitate God. But Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. The very first thing I had to understand was realize I didn't know his voice. So the very first thing he taught me was how to pray. Because I had 
to learn to hear him. I mean, how's he going to teach me otherwise, right? So the very first thing he taught me, and you can ask my wife, I, I told this last week to some people. The very first thing I did, I would get up in the mornings as the sun was coming up, and I'd just sit in my driveway with a cup of coffee and my Bible. And I would go, okay, here I am. And I'd let the Lord start teaching me. The very first thing he taught me was to be quiet. Quit talking. And I never realized that up until that point that it, that, that see, I had always, this is why I say the church misses it because they assume that, that a new believer gets this, that they understand this. I had always assumed that to pray was basically a petition. Everything from when I was a child, from now I lay me down to sleep to after I was an adult, it was, everything was, what can God give me? God give me this, bless me with that, take this, do this, do this, do that. And I thought that's what prayer was. As I grew older, I, could under, I thought that well, it was basically God. You were petitioning God and taking, doing your duty by praying for people that you know and stuff like that. And there was no intimacy in that. No. I mean, how would you like it that those of you that are parents, that every time that your child come up to you, that all they ever wanted to do was to ask you for something? I mean, that, that's it. There's no other conversation between you. They didn't want to talk to you unless they needed something. And every time that they talked to you, they, uh, basically they were wanting you to do something for them or do something for somebody else. You would have a tremendous lack of intimacy there, wouldn't you? What about your spouse? If every time your spouse walked up to you and said, and wanted to talk with you, the only conversation that there was was, here's my problems, here's what I want you to do for me, this is where you, it, it's not going well for me and I want you to fix that, this is what I want you to do for somebody that I know. You wouldn't have much intimacy there, would you? So he taught me to be quiet and that understanding that prayer is simply this, is talking with him and fellowshipping with him. It is spending time in his presence. He taught me to get sit there and just get with him. Now when I say get with him, there's not no magical combination. I didn't have to sing three or four praise and worship songs suddenly be in his presence. Getting in his presence was as simply as hey father I was there. And he told, taught me to stay there. In that place. Because in that place of his presence, that overwhelming presence of him is where change takes place. That part of you that you've been learning, that's that stuff that you've heard in the scriptures that says this is what you're that you've been made and how you're supposed to look. That's all these other times that you've been walking through your Christian walk and you've been white knuckling it, trying to get it to happen for you and never could. Suddenly, that's whenever the change starts taking place, and then you aren't doing it yourself. He makes that become a part of you. It's kind of like, uh, let me just kind of throw something out there. Okay, you have a struggle. Um, let's just say, for the sake of argument, you cuss. You have problems with your mouth. I know that there's some of the, nobody can relate to that in here, but let's just say you have a problem with that. And you spend all this time for years struggling trying to get yourself to stop making an effort 
meaning it. You want to stop, but you can't stop. It only works as long as you can white knuckle it. After a while, you get tired, or somebody makes you mad. And then suddenly, when somebody makes you mad, next thing you know, out it comes. And you don't even ask yourself, where did that come from? Because it's not you anymore. You kind of go, well, missed it again. Because even in your heart, when you ask that kind of question, you realize that you're realizing that it's not a part of you. You're trying to make it a part of you to change, but it's really not. But whenever you spend time with him and he starts changing you, then suddenly you find yourself not doing it, not trying to not doing it. You don't do it because it's not part of you. You don't have that desire. Because see, this, this is one of the most misused scriptures this, the, ever. The scripture says, God will give you the desires of your heart. I have heard pros, false teachers and prosperity gospel teachers take that verse and take it completely out of the role and try to teach people, you give to God and you give to me, you give, especially give to me, give to me money. And God's going to give you back, shaken down, pressed down, shaken, pouring out that you can't, and, and that God has laid up, uh, your money is with the wicked. The wicked is, uh, the money of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. And, and that, uh, and, and stuff like that. And and they take that and they say, if you give to me, God's going to give you the desires of your heart. We the desires of your heart, if you're not intimate with him and been changed, your your heart's desire might be simply, oh man, I want me a Harley Davidson. <laughs> That scripture doesn't mean that he's giving you the desires of your heart like that. Let, let, let me clue you in what it means. He's saying that if he will give you the desires that is in your heart, he will change your desires to line up with his desires. You understanding that? The subject is not it is that he's giving you what the desires are now in your heart. Not that he is going to basically become your holy ATM machine. It means he transforms you so that even your desires now are reflective of his desires. That's good. Can I step on it to be a touch on that one? No, that was good. So what I had to learn was to stay in his presence. He changes me so that, I, that I'm not having to have to make an attempt to do it. And so that if I mess up, if I mess up in some way, he's not, the, the attitude that I have isn't any longer, oh man, I was doing so good. Man, I went two months and didn't say a cuss word. Now I'm, I'm back doing it again. Is that when it comes out, your mouth, your mind, you, you and your heart go, what? Wait a minute, where did that come from? That's not me. And then you thank him because whenever he reminds you of it, he's not spanking you. He's fathering you. It's not condemnation. He's letting you know, hey, I'm still changing this in you, man. I love you. This ain't you. But I'm letting you know, this isn't who you are. You need to thank him then. Don't look at that being condemnation then for two, three weeks. You go, thank you, Father, for fathering me. Thank you for showing me that that you're changing me, that that's not who I am. That that's why it bothered me. It's because it's not who I am anymore. That wouldn't have bothered me six months ago. I'd have just blurted it out and went on about my day and had to give it another thought. The fact that it showed me, you showed me, says that I'm alive inside and that I'm yours and that you're changing me. See, that's the time for you praising God for the change. Uh, 
I remember hearing a, a pastor one time say something uh, that was absolutely true. He said if there was even, because see, there is no condemnation in, in the Lord. So you start getting condemned, you know it's not him. So, but he said if there was in something that you could pull out of condemnation that was good, it would be this one thing. Dead people don't have condemnation. If you weren't his, you couldn't be condemned. When you weren't born again, it didn't bother you to sin. Mm -hmm. That was your nature. That's what you did. You didn't have a problem with that. When you said a cuss word, it didn't bother you. That was just part of your language. Matter of fact, if you run across somebody who didn't cuss, you thought they were stupid or strange. So he told me to be quiet and to get into his presence in his sleep. And that change started taking place. And you know, when I did that, I started learning his voice. And not only that, the reality of who he is came into reality for me. Because suddenly... He was no longer a character in a book. So y'all don't act like y'all don't know what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. Because I could look at something in the scriptures and go, Lord, I don't know what this means. And you know what? He would answer me. I mean, just like suddenly, I'd go, this, this scripture doesn't make sense to me. And suddenly it's like, well, there it was. There was the answer. As I did that, nobody with denominational doctrines, because see, people who love the denominations and love denominational doctrine, their excuses is always, well, our denominational doctrines line up with the scriptures. No, really, if that's, if the reality of it is, is that if your denominational doctrines are lining up with the scripture, you don't need denominational doctrines, you've got the Bible. You don't need another doctrine to turn around and say, well, the Bible's true. That's kind of asinine. Denominational doctrines simply come up whenever someone says, hey, I don't like this right here. And, and that, that's if they're being honest with themselves. I don't like this. This don't make me comfortable. I'm going to look in here and try to figure out a way to make this not say this anymore. And then whenever they twist the scriptures, do theological gymnastics to a point that they can make it, try to make it say that, then they gather people around them that says this, that agrees to the same thing. And they basically say, you can be a part of my club if you agree with what I say. That's what a denomination is. I don't like denominations. I think it's of the devil. I think it's his way of the dividing the body of Christ. Because if everybody believed the scriptures, then we won't have this. And the only way that you really believe the scriptures is to do exactly what I just what I just told you I did with him. You lay everything aside and you say, this, all right, teach me what is in the scriptures. Because everything that I found in the scriptures, doctrines, doctrines and things like that from denominations, and what they say, I always... I look at it to see where does it say that. Like if, and, and I'm going to like step on some more toes. Like for example, people who deny that, that the power of God exists in the life of the believers today and tongues and stuff like that. I look in the scriptures and I can read it and I can see it there. Now, show me where it says in the scriptures that it's not happening now. That it's. And I've had people that's actually tried to make that argument. And basically they go to uh, one verse and it talks about when that which is perfect has come. Uh, but you can't take a verse out of context and try to make it into something. Because if you continue reading on in that chapter as Paul was saying that, he's saying that those things will take place, they, they will cease. But he says... Now we see, as in a, uh, let's see, what is it? 
Now we, we don't see clearly, but then we will see clearly because we will see one another face to face. He's talking about a person. That which is perfect has come is when Jesus comes again, when we are now with him. There will be no need for prophecy, no need for tongues, because he is here. It is an, a metaphor for Christ. He's talking about a person. So that verse doesn't mean that, okay, the Bible, because that's what they try to say. Well, now that we got the Bible, well, they had, the, they had their version of the Bible in the Jewish culture, too, and they still miss Christ. How can you say that a book suddenly is going to make them make everything right? It, now, you've got to have the, power, the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit to be there, or there's no life. Anyway, I digress. I love to get emails and ugly things on Facebook and stuff because I just said that. But I uh, in there a verse that says, for you, your children, your children's children, and those who are afar off, talking about it's mm. not just for yeah. people. It, it, it does not stop. And I, and I always, it, it, not until his return, it, because now even more than ever, we need to see the power of God in, in the church. Mm hmm and, and the thing is, is that whenever people start talking about tongues, tongues is a baby step into the supernatural. It is the first physical sign of something supernatural in the life of a believer. If you get hung up on tongues, how can you possibly get into even the deeper things of God? Laying hands on the sick and watching them be healed. Going and raising the dead and stuff like that. That's why it's so far-fetched for a lot of people. A lot of people in the church, whenever you start talking about laying hands on the sick and, and raising the dead, because even the most, the smallest things, the initial things are still so hung up on that they can't get past it. Two, it says, after saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. They are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So we go to Acts chapter 2.
had this conversation before, and people say John 20, 22 is divisive. Well, that's just because it goes against your belief. You don't want to believe it. Is that too much? <laughs> I'm good now. That's great. Let's see, I believe uh, you cannot believe that there's no way. Let's, uh, let's go here in Acts. I can't believe on that one right on the news right there did not put down. All right, help me out. Peter, speaking to... Uh, Acts 10. I want you to understand something. First off, praying in the Holy Spirit. That's how we kind of wound up here. This, there's going to be more to this. Just as God had, had, he had done whatever he created, man, what did God do? He breathed in him. Jesus breathed on them and new life came to them. Because, see, you have to understand it that way because of this purpose right here. If they received the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit at that point, what was Pentecost for? Somebody would have walked in there with a sword and stabbed them. Were they born again? Right, they were. So now there is something else. He says, I want you to wait in Jerusalem. After I've ascended, I want you to wait in Jerusalem until you receive power from above with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. One or two. One or two things. Two, two different things, right? I'm debunking a, a few things here. So, in Acts 10, in verse 44, Peter gets a vision of the Holy Spirit. The first thing he does is he sees a sheep come down with all types of animals. Peter is a Jew. He only eats what is kosher. But on this right here, there are all kinds of things that are not kosher. Pigs, things like that, that he is not supposed to eat according to Jewish law. God had done So, God tells him, he says, eat. And he says, no, Lord, I've never eaten anything that, that is unclean. He says, don't call anything that I've cleaned unclean. So 
So after he does, goes through this whole thing, the Holy Spirit tells him that there are some men that are coming, some soldiers, that he has sent them. He said, go with them. Don't be afraid because obviously the Romans wanted to kill Christians. was Cornelius house, a centurion it says that he was sympathetic to the Jews and had been following Jewish tradition and so they had been praying and he wanted, was God was honoring that and sent Peter to their house because Cornelius had a vision too and told, was told to go to send his, and get Peter and told him where he was. Right? So this is what he did. While Peter was speaking, Peter went there and was talking with Cornelius and his household. And it says, while Peter was still speaking the words, the Holy Spirit came down on all of those who heard the message. And he heard because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles for they heard them speaking in other language and declaring the greatness of God. And then Peter responded. He said, can anyone withhold water and prevent these from being baptized who, ha who have received the Holy Spirit? So right there blows the theory that whenever the Bible talks about baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's talking about baptism in water because Peter just saw them be baptized in the Holy Spirit, and he says, can anybody not get, uh, decline giving them water and let's baptize them in the name of Jesus? Right? Two separate things, right? And what was the way that he saw that they had been baptized in the Holy Spirit? They were speaking in other languages. In, in other words, tongues. That's what it is. Paul talks about this, about praying in the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 6, 18, I'm going to jump around several places here, so... And where he says, pray at all times in the spirit with every prayer and request and stay alert in this with all perseverance and intercession for the saints. Praying in the spirit. Okay. He makes a distinction. They know what praying is. He doesn't need to have somebody to, he doesn't need to go around and say, Praying in the spirit to people who already know, understood what praying meant. Right? He's making a distinction here. Now, let's go to another one. Acts 19, verses 1 through 7. disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now look at what he just said. They already were believers. He found disciples. And he asked them that. He says, they said, no, they didn't even know what the Holy Spirit was. No, we, we haven't even heard of, of that there's a Holy Spirit. Then he asked them what baptism were they baptized in. Now he's talking about water. And they said, well, we were baptized in John's baptism. They're still believers. They were just bad. The only baptism they had in water was John's baptism, telling people to repent that the Messiah is coming. 19. And Paul 
said, John baptized with the baptism of, well, look at there, I just said the same thing, telling us, telling the people that they should believe in the one who comes after him, that is in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began to speak in other tongues and to prophesy. Uh-oh. So they were baptized in the name of Jesus. And then he laid hands on them. And the Holy Spirit came on them, and they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And one or two different things. Two. Right? Jude. You don't have to turn there right this on this one right here. I'll just read this to you. Jude 21. Well, there's only one chapter. <laughs> Verse 20. But you, dear friends, as you build yourself up in your most holy holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourself in the love of God, expecting the mercy of the Lord for the eternal life. Why is Paul saying when he talks about build yourself up in the most, your most holy faith by praying in the Holy Spirit? What's he talking about? He's talking about a prayer language. He's talking about after you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, praying in the Holy Spirit. Your personal thing, your personal prayer language. And, and that's actually because we say that that way, it's given ammunition to people who basically want to, to deny that your personal prayer language. But the reality is, is that you're speaking in another tongue, a prayer of another tongue to God. Now, I want to address this. 1 Corinthians 14. chapter is, an, it is like an, an essential teaching, an amazing teaching. And also in the fact of trying to understand, in, in you understanding what is being said. Y'all say amen when you get there. First Corinthians chapter 14. Starting in chapter 1. Pursue love and desire the spiritual gifts. What? Desire spiritual gifts? Holy smokes, I thought it was over with. <laughs> and above all, that you may prophesy. So he's sitting there and he's actually separated prophecy from it so somebody can't actually say, the spiritual gifts, he was just being prophesied. Well, let's see what he was talking about. For the person who speaks in another language is not speaking to men, but to God, since no one understands him. Amen. However, he speaks mysteries in the spirit. Uh-oh. <laughs> Desire Pursue love and desire the spiritual gifts. And then he goes on to explain that he's talking about when he's saying spiritual gifts, he's talking about speaking in tongues. Uh oh. So if you go down to chapter 2, verse 14, I want you to understand this. This is what I'm saying. For if I pray in another language, my spirit prays. This is what a prayer language is. But my understanding is unfruitful. What then if I will pray with the spirit and I will also pray with my understanding? So when you pray in the Holy Spirit, it's not about you understanding it. It is, we don't pray as we ought to. See, you remember I was talking to her earlier about people asking things for God and, and think, and that's what we think. Well, he addresses something and he says, you receive not because you ask not. But then he gives a second part of that. 
He said, but when you ask, when you do ask, you ask amiss. Mm -hmm. Because you won't let for your own, to fill your own bellies and all that. This is why you're not receiving it. This is not why you're not receiving anything. It's a selfish, self-centered prayer. I remember um, Dan Moeller. I love Dan Moeller. He don't know his brother, but I love him. I brought I, I brought leaps and bounds listening to Dan Moeller. And he was telling the story about him and his, his wife. And Dan, before he was born again, was not Dan. He, he was kind of like Paul was not Paul was before, but he was Saul. And, that, and then he became Paul. Dan was not Dan before he was Dan. He was not good. He was a good sinner. And him and his wife, who his, his wife, who was a Christian, he just told her before they got married that he was because he was just trying to get in there. And their life was so hard for 13 years because of him, the way he acted, mistreating her, things like that. Then he gets, then they get so finally to the end point, she's had enough, and she's leaving him, and he's leaving her. They're all like, it's, that's what the courts would call an amicable divorce, separation and divorce. So he goes to work. Now he's known he went to church when he was a kid. He knows about Jesus. Matter of fact, Jesus had kind of like put stolen things in front of him to try to, to keep him from doing super stupid things. He goes to work and the Lord speaks to him. And he says, the Lord always said one thing. He said, he says, you don't even believe I'm real. He said, you didn't even, he didn't say, you ain't been to church, you ain't read your Bible. He said, you don't even believe I'm real. And before it was over with, he had an amazing transformation, kind of like this young man over here. Radical change. Well, when his wife finds out who had been praying for him for 13 years, she gets ticked at him and at God. Her answer was, I've been praying for 13 years for you to change this man, for him to get to re get saved. And now that it's too late, now that we're divorcing, you get him. He, he, He's born again. And Dan said that at first she didn't that she didn't really believe it. And so she would like they were still like they were living in the same house preparing for a divorce. Still raising their children together but not really together. And she would try to catch him. She would like act like she's going to go off with her girlfriends and like six hours later she would come back and try to catch him like she like he ain't really doing this just catch him doing something he, he used to do and the, when she did it she come in to catch him and he's sitting on the floor talking to his kids teaching them how to pray and he's like hey honey how are you and she says I, I, I thought you were what, what you doing here yeah, I thought you were going out and, and she, she run upstairs and act like she got something and left he said that, that all that kind of stuff continued, and, and I'm kind of paraphrasing the best I remember Dan's story because this is his personal testimony. He said that he was outside working in the yard, and his wife was upstairs, and she was going to go off with her friends or something like that, and she was in the bathroom getting ready. And as she was getting ready, those of you that have never had this happen, you're just going to have to kind of like imagine it because those of us that's had this kind of thing happen in your life I, I get it Jesus walked in the back it says you just know it I don't know if some of you have ever had an absolutely tangible encounter with the Lord it's like whew, you, you ain't going hmm. is that God you're like oh my God that's what you're doing 
what she had. She's getting ready, and Jesus walks into the bathroom. And according to what he says, she said was is that she, you just knew there he was. And because she got so mad at God, whenever he got saved, she told God, said, she told was told God, she says, I don't want to have nothing to do with him, and I don't want to have nothing to do with you anymore. So when Jesus walked in the room, he was this shows you just what real love is. Love does not seek us all. It does not count wrongs, does it? Jesus walks in and he doesn't go, huh, that, that was some pretty hurtful words that you said to me the other day. He came in with a purpose to minister to him, to restore. Him. And he, she said, he, what he said to her was this Why are you angry at that man? That is not the man that you even married. Mm. It said, he told her, he answered her question. He said, for all those years that you prayed for, me, for your husband, you were not really praying for your husband because you, your heart was for him and wanted him to be safe. You were praying for your husband to be saved because you knew that that would transform him and make your life better. And he said, that is a selfish, self-centered prayer that I cannot answer. So the end result was is that she come running out the back door of the house crying, the ugly cry, screaming, crying. Dan said he looked over at her and then thought, she was doing the kind of cry like I just got a phone call that somebody in our family has died kind of cry. Running across there and he's like, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong? Somebody did and that. she's running to him going, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And he's like, what you sorry for? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And she tells him the story and he says, she, she's crying. He says, I started crying too. He says, well, you was crying. He said, it was just messy. <laughs> Self-centered, selfish prayer. See, we have, that's why the church has dealt with for a long time. And you see it. You see it on a regular basis. You watch the same people that come down to the altar every single Sunday. The same people that are every single Sunday that are on Facebook saying, you need to pray for me for this and you need to pray for me for that and all that. It's all about something and they don't know who they are in this. It's, see, a Christian is the one with the answer. should be so grounded in his love and knowing him, you already know the outcome. He loves you. And so you're not having to be, you're not moved. You're immovable. Yes, bad things do take place and happen, but it doesn't have to move. It doesn't have to change who you are. But see, because the church doesn't understand who she is anymore, that's what you see. You see them come, people that are constantly asking for prayer for something because they don't know who they are and they are moving. It's kind of like walking in divine hell. Somebody would ask you, why do you believe it that, that you can walk in divine hell? How, how can you possibly believe that you're untouchable? I have been a Christian for 30 years and I get sick. Your answer can simply be because you believe you're touchable. But when we pray in the Holy Spirit, you don't you bypass that selfishness because the Holy Spirit is praying with you and praying out the mysteries of God. He's praying out, helping you pray out the will of God. And you don't even understand what you're saying. That's what praying in the Holy Spirit is. That's the purpose of the Holy Spirit. Because you can pray out that, and your mind can never engage anything during that. Because you're praying in a language that you don't even know yourself. Now, what's, the, what's the difference between speaking in tongues and praying in tongues? Speaking in tongues, and Paul addresses that in chapter 14. He 
he's talking about two different things. He's bringing in, he's talking about prayer language, speak, praying in tongues. And then he also talks about speaking in tongues, which is a form of prophecy. That is, he's talking about someone stands up in the middle of the congregation and speaks in tongues. And he says, when somebody does that, there has to be an interpretation because the people cannot be edified about with what you're saying because they don't know what you're saying. They can't say it. He says they can't say amen to it because they don't know what you're saying. But then when you have an interpreter stands up, then it becomes a form of prophecy. You've basically spoken something from the Holy Spirit. Okay? Talking he's talking about he, that is that he's putting order in. So he's making it clear on that. So he says, so let's go ahead and, and, and finish this up so that I don't want to start leaving before I'm finished. He goes on in chapter uh, 14 at verse 18. He says, I thank God that I speak in other languages more than all of you. So Paul is talking about it. And then he goes on even in the verse 39. Therefore, my brothers, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in other languages, but everything must be done in a decent, decently and in order. You see now what he says? He, he, he summed that up. What his purpose for writing in there. So they kind of give you an idea of what was going on in the church in Corinth. The church in Corinth was a messed up church. It's amazing. It was very messed up. They had active sin going on in the church. They had a guy that was all that uh, was shacked up with his stepmom and wouldn't stop. They had all this kind of stuff going on. And whenever he, uh, it, even in all of that stuff, the gifts were still working. The gifts were still active in the church because God is faithful. So he starts bringing correction to the church. Whenever he starts talking earlier about speaking in tongues, he says, talking about spirituals. First off, let me explain something to you. Almost every single place in the book of Corinthians that says that, that we have translated as meaning saying gifts actually is not what the original language says it is. The original language says it's charismata. Gifts, it is um, grace effects. Charisma is grace. It is effects of grace. Okay? For some reason, we've, we've called it gifts. But the reality is, is that it is the effect of the grace of God, of the Holy Spirit being in you. And that's what he goes on to correct. Because what his correction, what's ironic is, is that the correction that he was given to the church in Corinth is what you see oftentimes in churches today that still believe in the gifts. And he was correcting them in the church in Corinth. Because what they were doing in there where the gifts were working, what he was seeing was, it was, they were living this way. Well, if you need a gift of prophecy, go to the Sister Jennifer there. And if, if you need uh, healing, go to Brother Brad over here. And if you, you know, and that's how they were saying this. These, each one of these people, you know, have got this like special gift. And you see that all over Christian number. But Paul was trying to correct them. He was saying, "Listen," he says, "Your faith," and I'm paraphrasing now. But he said, "You're saying this stuff." He said, "But it's the same Holy Spirit." He said, "The Holy Spirit that is in you." You have access to all gifts at whatever given time it's needed. He's, he, the Holy Spirit doesn't divide himself up and say, well, this one's got this gift and you can't do nothing else. And this has got this gift and you can't do nothing else. And you got to seek them out to find the right one that's got the right gift that you need at the moment. And Paul's going, that's not it. These are all the effects of grace in your life. By the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And they are there for whatever need is necessary. So when you're walking through Walmart, 
and somebody's over there sick. You don't have to go call up Brother Brad. Can you come over here? So and so sick. Go lay hands on them. Because you have the same Holy Spirit. Amen. The same Holy Spirit in you, the same one that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, has done every single healing and miracle that has ever been done. And he lives in each one of us. Amen. So what are you going to run across that he can't handle? It makes it sound kind of silly now, some, some of the stuff that we're doing in it. See, this is about the identity of the, the believer. See, this is the thing that I've noticed. I don't know if this is something. I, I'd say it's a, it's a tactic of the enemy. If the enemy can always think that a get a believer to believe that they're always lacking, he can get them to not do the ministry and the work of the gospel. If he can always make you think that you're always trying to attain something, he will keep he can keep you from doing the work of the gospel because you don't know who you are. Because when you know your identity in Christ, when you know him, then you're not having to worry about that because you know that all of God is in you. And you and him are one. Right? Now you have the answer. And the gospel is simple. But what he does is he teaches. He, he convinces spiritual leaders in the church. To teach the gospel. And your walk in Christ. As you're, you're taking steps to try to attain something. To try to get there. When the reality is, is that the new that the new covenant is not teaching you what it says. It's not teaching you this is what you got to do in order to get this. It's teaching you this is what's already in you. This is who's already in you. Now let this be what comes out of you. Because that's who you are. So when it comes to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you can't walk in the power of God without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because it's talking about without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because if you could, Pentecost was, there was no need for Pentecost. Once Jesus breathed on the disciples, that, should, that would have been it, right? But he said, power will come on you. See, we've been given authority, but when the Holy Spirit comes, we have now received power to back up that authority. That makes sense? Praying in the Holy Spirit helps to build your faith. Because I, I'm serious. You know, when, I talk, when I'm telling you about spending time in, in the quiet, it is similar to that of praying in the Holy Spirit. Because, see, when you're petitioning God, a lot of what we're petitioning is coming out of fear, out of our head. We're thinking through it. Uh, oh, I need to pray, pray for brother so and so. Oh, I need to pray for my mom. I need to pray for this person, right? When you're praying from the Holy Spirit, you can feel the difference. It comes from Absolutely. Power. There's something along with what you've been saying that wasn't there before. And it changes you. And it builds your faith. You grow in faith. Because it's now you're seeing something, a physical reality to something spiritual. 
Am I making sense to anybody? You getting anything out of this? Now, if you're born again and you have not 